Um, and in another way, like I, again, sort of thinking about subversion um, and um, making a space that is intended to be a, like a functional space for the viewing of art, um, sort of undermining that um, possibility. This is a piece that I actually did at McScreen Gallery in New York, um, and um, for a show that was actually titled kind of Paper City. But um, again, I kind of replicated the lights that were already there in the space and rotated that track lighting. 90 degrees to create a kind of modernist grid and then flip that grid onto the adjoining walls in the floor so you know in this space that was white walls and white floor the most kind of sterile innocuous space that you could imagine for viewing art or like maybe we would say super stylish place for making art um i you know i kind of made this um barricade uh, to keep you from getting any closer to the artwork that i made and made that barricade out of the work itself. Um, so one of the reasons that I actually choose paper um, and actually am interested in inst installation is because I have a background in fibers and ceramics. Um, so uh, after I graduated from undergrad, I had piles of stuff, piles and piles and closets and corners and then my mom's barn and then her pole barn and like I had a lot of stuff and um, and of course my mom being like a lovely mother was always like pulling out you know like if I like the first bowl I ever threw was like there holding her bobby bobby pins in the bathroom which is like fantastically sentimental and um, but also like super painful for me to have to look at <laughs> you know like every time I go visit her like there it is um, and it's like a, a tombstone for this period of art that I've like passed from or passed through and so um, I very consciously um, started making work that although might have been time consuming in its construction could essentially be like recycled or destroyed um, at the end of an exhibition so um, not only you know as a kind of to rid myself of it when I was done with an installation, but also um, to kind of uh, reinforce the idea of impermanency that I was um, seeing in the world. Um, so this piece is titled Enough, and this is, um, again, in a like, really horrible, not great for viewing art space, um, this is, but um, you know, like a generous gallery space. Um, I projected this kind of three-dimensional line drawing of all of the forms, architectural forms within the space, one foot out towards the viewer. Um, so, uh, you know, you were in a room that was probably about this size, that was carpeted, that, you know, suddenly like looked like it was empty, and then um, through the shadows on the wall, um, you could start to discern the fact that all of the forms had been replicated and kind of pushed in towards you. Um, and it's what sort of creates a hypercube that's up on the right hand side or you know any of this kind of doubling or lights and that kind of doubling giving you a second opportunity to look at those forms um the other thing that has been of interest to me in any of these interventions is that despite my attempt to exactly mimic or mirror any of these forms like my the kind of quirkiness of my hand or like the clumsiness of the weight of the line, you know, the thickness of the line, sort of makes these things into cartoons or caricatures of themselves. Um, and so, um, you know, I am also interested in this kind of inability to perfectly re replicate or perfectly um, render any kind of form, that there's always a kind of process of interpretation that comes between me and that object. Um, and that that in a lot of ways is sort of, uh, you know, a parallel to the way that I view like seeing or being in the world. Um, and then this piece is actually uh, from a gallery that was, again, like I keep being in these galleries that are not um, ideal spaces and they make me do things with the work that, um, I, uh, like they make me in, like, invent something new. Um, so, this piece was actually in a gallery in the summertime that it was an old house and so the windows were always open in the gallery um, and it was in New York City and so um, I made these little like replicated capitals um, and this kind of, I don't know, it's like party bunting or something like that. That's a replication of the, um, 
the uh, egg and bar um, uh, molding. Um, but what happened because the windows were always open is that the piece would actually move. So not only were you getting a sense that there was a kind of double image or a triple or quadruple image when you looked at something, but those that image, the drawing was actually kind of moving in time. Um, and one thing that people have often said about the way that a lot of these doubling, these works that kind of double things or that are line drawings of things, is that it makes them feel like they're like high or they're having some kind of psychotic break or something like that, um, which I think is really fantastic because like I did almost nothing, you know, or you know it was labor intensive, but really like my intervention was just to give them like double vision in in real life and that kind of act, inability to focus or perceive something clearly um, leads one to think of a kind of alternate psychological state or remember some kind of alternate psychological state um, and um, and I think that you know you know obviously mystics have often thought about these alternate psychological states as opportunities to actually witness um, the divine so I mean if you can see the divine inside of like a, a bath in Thailand or a urinal I think that's pretty good. Um, so uh, um, also, um, also on another track, um, um, I have done a lot of uh, several residencies, and these have been in different kinds of places. Um, one of the first residencies that I did after graduate school was um, in Oakland, California. Um, and uh, how, like, how many of you guys have been out to Oakland? None, one, two, a few. So, like. I mean, I think as a Midwestern girl, even though I've been around and I've seen the world and things like that, I think that it's really easy to kind of project um, a stereotype of a place, you know, on, you know, like onto our perceptions of that place before we arrive there. So one of the things that I um, had really thought about California, you know, like you get this, um, it's like a place where anything is possible. It is the end of manifest destiny. Like it is as far away as we can go without falling off that side of our country or that side of the, the continent. Um, but um, also, of course, like Oakland is known for its incredible gang violence and the kind of how um, how intense the kind of demarcation lines are between what belongs to one gang and what belongs to another gang. Um, and then it's also this particular location in Oakland that my residency was, is also right near um, Alameda, like the docks. Um, and so there's a lot of industrial and post-industrial waves going on. This happens to be a place that was trying or was reclaimed from um, its history of industry and is now condos. Um, so, so say that the actual, you know, uh, making of value, um, creation of value. But anyway, so so this this piece was actually a response to this idea that there is a kind of fluid ability to like move, move across a country, move across a landscape. But um, the little sort of balsa wood pieces that I created in response to this staircase are actually three-dimensional projections of a two-dimensional idea of perspective. So it is a little bit easier to see in there. So, you know, at one point you would actually look at this thing and it up here is like a three-dimensional form. And in other points of view, it actually flattens the three-dimensional space behind it. Um, and so these um, were kind of like, they interceded on these stairs that go up and they would actually go up to my sleeping loft. So I didn't want anybody going up there. So I made this piece to actually keep them from moving up there. Um, and, you know, this is actually another piece within that same space. Um, and again, this kind of deals with, you know, a fantasy of what a place is and then the reality of what that place is. Um, so, um, so, you know, upon entering the space, you get this point of view where it's like, you know, rainbow happy time. And this is actually flagging tape that you would use um, to mark, like, if you had a gas lines or underground, what, you know, whatever, whatever, electricity or something like that. The other thing about um, making art way out at the edge of this um, 
town was that the only two places that I had to do art supply shopping were the hardware store and uh, a party supply store. So, I mean, you, you may do, right? Um, so, so, I actually, this is essentially a drawing of the negative space, um, project, uh, the neg negative space of each one of these, you know, uh, like in this staircase railing, projected out um, into three dimensional space. And then um, each time it hit the wall, it would actually change its trajectory to kind of meet back with the original form. Um, and so, um, again, from either from entering the space or from above, one would have the point of view of this kind of like riotous, um, rainbow, happy land. That was, you know, it, the colors were certainly inspired also by the, um, like how many murals I would actually see that were um, implying a kind of uh, social connectivity um, and positivity. Um, but actually when um, a viewer would try to enter this space, they would be cut off or blocked from actually moving forward. They would be trapped within the different kind of planes um, of the illusion. And then of course it ends in an illusionistic one. Um, and so these, these kinds of works that sort of maybe initially appear very formal, a lot of times are inspired by um, uh, um, like cultural incidents or cultural qualities that um, exist in, within the site. Um, so this um, piece was done in Oslo about a year ago. Um, and um, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the, bomb, the bombing in Oslo? Does anybody remember this? One, two, like, do you remember what happened? No? Um, so, sorry. yeah, go ahead. The, 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 the terrorist bombing in Oslo. So, so what happened was like a guy who was actually, um, uh, like, he believed in the purity of, you know, um, like in purity of a racial identity. Um, and a lack of immigration. Um, it, it was essentially stood for no immigration um, into Norway, uh, went to two locations and bombed these locations. And so one was in the city center, it was actually um, at the parliament, and then the other, he actually took a boat to a small island um, off of the coast of Oslo that was a camp. And that camp had, you know, children on it. Now, Norway is a super tiny country. Um, it's also incredibly wealthy. Um, but because it's super tiny, this camp happened to be a place where, um, you know, there, like, I think, you know, there were a huge proportion of the young Norwegian population happened to be also attending this camp. So um, the people that this bomber injured, um, you know, everybody knew someone who had been injured or that was like their son's best friend who had been injured. It was like a huge catastrophe in the country. Um, but upon, you know, going to Oslo, um, one of the most interesting things that I noticed was that almost nobody was talking about it. So this was just a couple of months after the incident. Even though it had touched everyone very personally, there was a kind of um, implication of normalcy on the surface. And so, but that da sort of down, um, down just below the surface, there was a huge rupture in the way that Norwegians thought about their own society. Um, and so um, when I was sort of conceiving of the piece that I would do at the drawing center there, um, this, this, I started thinking about these sort of steps, that these steps are very familiar. They kind of, you know, they are, they are a way that um, the people who work in this gallery kind of go up and down. But with the kind of addition of like one unit, they start to fall apart. Their structural integrity starts to fall apart in this, what becomes a drawing, that starts as a drawing and becomes a three-dimensional form. And then with the addition of two or three units, um, the entire form starts to fall apart. Um, it's sort of like this, um, systematic cancer um, in the work. And so there's a detail. Um, so again, just thinking a, a lot about how these kind of subtle shifts will cause somebody to kind of re, 
reassess their their sort of relationship to a location. Um, you know, I've been sort of working in these kind of cyclical means. So you know, maybe working with something that involves line, and then dealing with something that involves something like form and repositing a location in, in relationship to things. Um, but um, you know, like as one progresses, one builds a body of work, right? But then at the same time as you're working on this, or as I was working on this body of work, I started to be able to expect or anticipate what the outcome would be, right? So like, you know, the first time is an experiment, the second time is a kind of refinement, but by the third or fourth time, I was starting to get bored with the, the things that I was doing in the studio myself. You know, and, and I didn't want to be in that space anymore. So I started to kind of try to reach out um, and do some custom work or um, work that actually would function within a different or a kind of utilitarian space. So this was the piece that was commissioned by the West Collection. Are you guys familiar with that? Anyone? Yes? Okay, the graduate students who are here really should be, um, but even undergrads, like if you're close to graduating, you can't be a current student and apply for it. But every year, um, the West Collection has a call for entries, and they have a top 10 of their call for entries of work that they're going to purchase. They essentially do a $10,000 commission for each of the top 10. And then one of those top 10 winners will win a an additional $25,000 prize. So this is a very, very significant, right? <laughs> um, and also, um, the West, the ethos of the West Collection is to collect emerging artists, like where they're just on the brink of sort of coming out into a larger, um, a larger career. So it's fascinating to actually walk around the offices where this collection is housed, and you know, you'll see like. You know, every big Munez, you know, like you'll see, you know, it's essentially just like walking through a contemporary art museum, but it's housed inside of an office building. So it's pretty fascinating, and it was a, an extreme honor to be included in there. And they invited me to actually do a piece that was specific to their space. So the West Collection is actually housed inside of a, a financial services collection that has a pretty strange, um, uh, way of being for financial services people. They're very democratic, so everybody gets the same desk, the same chair, the same computer. Everybody has the same everything. Um, and as you can imagine, bankers tend not to be so democratic, but you know that. Um, so um, I actually decided that I would make one of their desks, computer sets, all entirely out of paper, and then that would be placed back within the context of one of their functioning sets. So as time went on, like their sets would be like cleans and you know, people would put up like pictures of their kids or you know, whatever, somebody would spill coffee. Um, and and you know, their unit would retain its kind of pristine nature, but because their lives would spill over onto this form, this thing would act like a sponge and sort of absorb all of the imperfections that um, could be wiped up in another context. So again, everything out of paper. And then again, just kind of looking at some of the formal properties of what's going on in a space. Um, so I was recently in an exhibition um, in Western PA um, and in Cleveland. Um, and, uh, you know, this exhibition was actually an opportunity for me to kind of clear my, clarify my thoughts. Although Shannon didn't bring it up, um, thankfully. Um, I was on a TV show um, titled Work of Art. And um, I actually went on this show because of a lot of personal reasons. But um, in terms of studio reasons, again, it had a lot to do with the fact that I was to the point in my own studio practice where I could anticipate everything that was about to happen. You know, like I, I knew. I knew what a move meant. I knew how it would affect a viewer. I knew what it would look like in a space. I like knew everything. There were no surprises left anymore. Um, and so I thought, like, wouldn't it be fantastic if I put myself through a torturous um, process of trying to create an, an artwork in 12 hours? Wouldn't that be great? 
and then having to do that day after day on no less sleep. I mean, it was just like being in art school, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, like I went through that, and it was pretty, like you know, it 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 was pretty exciting, obviously, um, but um, and adventurous and uh, weird. Um, but what was good about it was that it actually kind of, through going through that process, it forced me to kind of remix my ideas and think about some new ways to kind of loosen things up. Um, so this was the first piece that actually came after going through that process, where I'm starting to kind of introduce color. Um, I'm still obviously interested in the architectural and what we believe is permanent. <laughs> Um, but then um, really kind of showing like a, a, a different kind of sense of ephemerality and mobility within that piece. Um, and then also this is where the wind comes back because um, there are actually fans in here that like billow this, these weird illusionistically perspectival forms around. Um, and then this is a of, an image of the piece from the outside. So it became like a, you know, a large scale shadow box. Um, and then that has actually led to a couple of other recent pieces that are not site specific. So, sorry, this is not a great slide, but um, this is actually an, a photograph of a piece of tarp on the floor that I then turned into a stencil, made a drawing of, and then sort of separated out into these layers of positive and negative space. And then those actually kind of billow in the breeze and there's a mirrored piece of mylar in between. So they're in the way that you kind of had a sense of like motion parallax in something like this and a feeling like the building was falling down as you were watching it. Um, here you had no, like, again, you had no ability to kind of focus on any one plane um, and everything was kind of moving simultaneously. So additionally, I've also worked in um, uh, photography, um, and uh, like I'm not a traditionally trained photographer. Um, I was talking about uh, digital photography with some of the grad students just over lunch. Um, but a lot of times I actually use this as a way of sort of looking at different methods of representation, and then how we think of these things as true or alterable. So this is actually, um, uh, those are photographs on either side of this um, metal case, and then um, the photographs actually rolled up on the interior. So it's a photograph of the thing surrounding and kind of beatifying this thing. Weird thing. And then, um, uh, you know, really dealing with, again, a kind of photographic site specificity, looking at um, the floor of this space and then creating the kind of illusion of cast shadow or cast shadow, shadow turning into three-dimensional form or then falling back into cast shadow. Um, one thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is that I'm actually, or I've talked too much about, is that I'm actually the head of the drawing department at the Cleveland Institute of Art. So even though I have degrees in fiber and ceramics, I teach drawing mostly. <laughs> um, and so um, really just going through this process of thinking about illusion and representation and veracity um, has made me really think about how I perceive the world on a very basic epistemological level. Like, how do we know the things we know? Um, and so, you know, that again sort of leads me back to the quotidian or the familiar. You know, how do we know that stairs are stairs, that it's not just an illusion, that we could fall up or down? Um, so these are um, not real functioning stairs, although tiny children would attempt to like, run up and down in space. <laughs> Um, but then again, this is, uh, you know, it, this was a piece that um, was a parallel piece to an M.C. Escher exhibition. Um, uh, you know, and I always loved the tessellations as a kid, but I'm, I'm actually not a fan of the stair pieces. I have no idea why that happened to be the thing that ended up being the case here. But, um, but really starting to think about how I could take take the kind of flat or two-dimensional space of the floor floor, and fold it up and make it into three-dimensional space, have it kind of climb around the room, and then fall back into the two dimensions. And then what you're seeing there in the little circles are actually the lights from that space. Um, and then, count for something completely different. Um, so this summer, I was actually on a residency at the Headlands. Um, and uh, again, I'm kind of continuously trying to figure out ways of 
breaking myself from habits or actually trying to find something inventive or new in, in, in a site or in a location. Although, when I went to the Headlands, I had a plan. The Headlands actually has a bunch of World War II bunkers um, that were never used um, because uh, World War II never came uh, to California um, in quite that way. Um, but so these bunkers were actually positioned sort of looking out over um, the Pacific Ocean. Um, but one of the kind of very specific things about being in Sausalito and San Francisco is that there's this fog. And the fog rolls in um, and kind of creates this um, illusion of disappearance. Um, and so one of the things that I was certainly thinking about while I was there um, was about this kind of... A, a way that, you know, war gets manifest through an object, um, or a war that is kind of, yeah, the way that war is manifest through an object or a space, and that that is a kind of fiction in and of itself. Um, and so uh, I created this kind of room full of fake fog through dry ice and, um, uh, you know, like a smoke machine. Um, and so it was kind of like a 1980s rock show. And then <laughs> I um, uh, was skating through that space. So really thinking about um, the different histories, like art history, but also this kind of um, art history of the landscape, but art history also of the performance work of the 1960s, and then what that would mean within this kind of site of the, the former military base kind of creating a fiction, a fiction of an event, a fiction of a, um, of a way of making the fog outside, and then creating the illusion that that, that would be manifest. Um, and then another piece that I actually did, um, again, in this more performative route, was this um, very circuitous walk that I would, um, I would essentially like take the longest path possible to get to one of these bunkers, or almost the longest path possible to get to one of these bunkers. Um, and I would do this um, almost daily while I was out there in the residency, and then I would um, mount um, uh, a flag of surrender. So, like I was surrendering a bunker that never needed to be surrendered because fog or because war never actually came to lose that um, that part of the country. So, you know, again, thinking about this kind of illusion of permanence, an illusion of what the purpose for a space was, and then attempting to recontextualize it by um, essentially like a repetitive act. So um, one of the grad students was asking me about like what I do in the studio when um, I don't have a big installation going and I mostly like screw around with stuff. I screw around with um, familiar everyday objects and again try to find something revealing inside of them. So this is um, an inside out volleyball and Eureka is actually what's printed on there. Um, it was actually super fantastic when the volleyball was inflated, but then I popped it, like the, when the bladder was inflated, because it looked like two big boobs. <laughs> and then, um, I, I, like, I started doing a kind of a series of book works that has resulted in um, a piece that I have up right now in New York, or a series of pieces that I have up. But um, essentially kind of performing ritualistic acts on the books that are similar to the acts that are described in the text. So this is actually a 1960s book, um, or um, it's kind of like a, um, it was like a hardcover magazine about travel, but very exclusive travel. And one of the places that they actually traveled to in in this interior, in the in the text in here, was a place where they did ritual scarification. And so I ritually um, scarified, scarred the book in a similar way. As you would have, as, as you saw in the interior, um, and then you know, there's like cheesy stuff in the world, so I need some cheesy stuff. <laughs> this is like, I'm, honestly, I think this is like the ugliest balloon I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> it says "I love you," and it has like uh, these hideous roses printed all over it, and you know, I just thought it was so like disgustingly, um, I don't know, optimistic that I had to do something like a little bit like secretly angry. 
Um, and then uh, finally, like I, I, I've, um, a recent body of work has also started working with, um, or I've started working with text quite a bit, and again with these kind of found texts, um, and making them relatively unrecognizable through the intervention um, uh, that I perform on them, so that you have a kind of echo of what the previous form was, but then it's been um, abstracted. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the ways in which this actually refers um, to like the, uh, the graphic design of an art historical moment, or like an art historical moment in graphic design that's sort of early Bauhaus, um, but it, uh, you know, it's no longer legible. So using this kind of aesthetic to undermine the purpose of the original graphic design. Um, thank you. So do you guys have any questions? About anything? Yeah, I wanted to ask Sarah. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier in some of the pieces about the self the self diversity mm -hmm. in the artwork. And that's kind of something that I was dealing with a lot. I, I I guess I wanted to know um, how does that translate for you and in which ways do you, uh, do you think you should translate that best in your, in your artwork? Well, I think, um, so, I, like, I'll say this through sort of an anecdote. I went to an all-girls Catholic school forever. And so, like, they teach you to be nice. Like, they teach you to be a very, very nice girl and to be, like, polite. And um, also uh, not to necessarily have a critical voice. And so um, I think that that kind of restraint from a very early age made me want to um, like break shit down from the inside out. You know, so like that I understood the structure of an organization, or I understood the structure of. Um, you know, like a habit or a way of being. And then I wanted to undermine that kind of from its very core. So that you initially would see the thing and imagine it for what it was. You would sort of see the surface. Um, but then for almost anybody that took more than like 10 seconds to look at it, they would notice that it was fundamentally ruptured and that that fundamental rupture called into question the purpose of the thing in the first place. So, I mean, when I'm sort of thinking about um, like being subversive, I mean, it's kind of like a, an emotional release, right? But it also, I want to critique, um, you know, I am actively trying to critique a system from within that system. And so when things have worked out best, have been, you know, at the points at which, um, I think at the points at which I'm actually, there's a kind of visual, revel like a profound visual revelation for somebody where there's a kind of intense intervention. Um, and that has a lot to do with why, you know, some of my more recent pieces have been much more sort of visually bold um, uh, because maybe I'm like, I think at this point I'm ready to like follow the rules less and less. So yeah, that does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really admire how articulate you are about uh, your work and okay. appreciate um, the feeling you feel mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, the, and the object as well as the way you approach. And I'm curious about um, if you could talk a little bit when you're on site, um, your responsiveness to the space. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it um, are the pieces change that bug while you're in there, or is it? Um, now I have a tendency to do that a little bit more. I think um, so. I think one of the one of the issues that I was sort of getting trapped within was that that I think I was having this conversation with another with one of the grad students is that you know a viewer would have an aha moment and then like they understand the piece and then that was it like that was the end of the work I mean unless that aha moment really like hit a chord with them there was no, there were no few there were no more levels to go to in the work and then if 
uh, if it didn't hit the accord with them and they just realized this intervention, then they just thought I was like crazy and labor intensive, which I could I could care less about how long it takes me to make anything. Um, so. So initially, with you know the majority of this body of work, there was no there was no screwing around. You know, like I set a rule and I perform that rule. It's very like sentences on art. You know, um, and uh, maybe because it's not like you know maybe because it's 2012 now, then I you know have given myself permission to start screwing with things a little bit more. So. Um, in like the piece that I did at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland where there was actually that kind of um, the, the drawing or the essentially like a spray paint on mylar, you know, that the, the, there's part of that that actually like folds back within the structure that kind of openly acknowledges the kind of fabric-like quality of that intervention and that happened by accident because I was trying to like crawl around inside the work to make it function properly, like to make the plan happen. And I had to tie it back at one point and I just liked the way it looked. You know, and so like I and and I also thought that that actually that sort of accident heightens the content of the work in a way that if I had only done what I had planned, my it wouldn't have been there. So now I'm much more willing to screw around with stuff, um, and I'm and I'm also much more interested in how um, there's a difference between the facade and the um, or how we are so ready to believe the facade. That's actually what it is. We are so ready to believe what a facade is that that um, more and more I think we're unwilling to kind of like delve deep into something. I mean think about it today like I was in Ohio at the height of the end of the election and like no there was no actual information in any of the sloganeering on either side you know it was just like facade after facade and if whoever hit you more with that surface was like the winner which you know like that to me seems completely absurd and to me seems to be like a real problem in terms of contemporary society that we're like so willing to believe the surface You know, if there's like blue, it's sort of picking up on something in a space, or orange, or whatever the case might be. Um, or it's being brought in through a kind of reflectivity. So I'm like actively incorporating the color of the site into the work um, because you can't escape it because there's a mirror. Um, but um, but so I'm interested in like in that aspect of color. It's still sort of site dependent. Um, and then I think that, um, I think that although I am making doppelgangers for things, um, that, uh, that they don't need to be so overtly a toast anymore. And um, although I was interested in, again, you know, in this kind of you know, like this grid is a grid of paper, but it's also a minimalist grid. You know, and it's very like tied to that history, and it allowed me to claim, you know, somebody like Solid for myself. Um, uh, you know, somebody I admired, but also had my um, doubts about. You know, this kind of like perfection and precision and all of that that's implied in that kind of replication. Um, and so, um, and so, as like, you know, like. I did it, you know. <laughs> like I made my grid, I made my stuff. Like I, like I claimed it, and so like now I can, I feel like I can move on. Um, and um, I mean, I think white for me is very seductive, you know, because there are all of these sort of automatic things that we can project on it 
this kind of, again, this minimalist, the white box, this kind of purity, this, there's an implication of a purity of intellectual pursuit. There's all this stuff that it already comes loaded with that um, makes it, that sort of like, makes it an awesome color to choose, you know, like black is an awesome color to choose because of, you know, exactly the same, you know, or very similar reasons, you know, that it implies like, it implies I'm smart. I don't actually have to be smart, you know. So, so, um, and 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 I think like in, in a lot of the pieces, I was actually choosing it for, you know, um, like I had real critical reasons. But you know, I'm uh, as I'm sort of moving into the present and the future, I'm much more kind of critical of those that kind of range of choices. Um, you know, it's like, I was actually, I was privileged also to give a lecture at Kent State University um, uh, while I've been an escapee from New York. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm sure that your faculty say to you all the time is that you really need to take chances, right? Like, you need to take chances in the studio. You need to, like, you need to try new things. Once you graduate from undergraduate or graduate school and you get a little bit of attention for whatever this thing is that you do um, and that attention could be like from galleries or museums you could have a collector base you could suddenly have you know whoever commissions it becomes much or for me and I can say on the part of some of my colleagues it becomes much scarier to take a chance on and there's no, and there is a very good chance that you're not going to have a lot of people in your like immediate environment that are telling you to take a chance. So it behooves it behooves you, but it really like in the studio it behooved me to put myself in a variety of situations in which I had to take a chance. I couldn't like just stay doing exactly the same thing that I was doing because I mean for me. Art is a, like making art is about a kind of investigation of my relationship to the world, and so if I am just sort of like doing something by rote, I'm no longer involved in any kind of investigation of the world. You know, so um, I mean, this is not to say that you don't build a body of work. I obviously have a body of work, but um, but that that there come points in your career where you need to like, you know, keep yourself in the ass. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. A lot of your works, I mean, such errors have since the novel and the mm -hmm. What are your emotions? When I'm doing that? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, like, okay, so, I mean, there are, like, I had a nice um, studio visit with some of these nits in here, and then, you know, there are plenty of you who are sort of like, doing repetitive things, like when you learn to throw, right? For those of you who are in ceramics, you throw 100 cups. Like, you go through a range of emotions <laughs> when you throw 100 cups. Um, and if there are any of you who are like weavers or anything like that, um, uh, you know, like you know that there's a kind of, um, you can really relax into the practice once you know what that is, like you can, it can be very meditative, um, and that can be a very positive thing because I can, you know, spend time thinking about the content of the work. Um, I can spend time thinking about the next piece that comes from it, or like daydreaming or whatever, listening to NPR or like punk rock or whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, but I think that, um, you know, having this background of like doing repetitive things, of being a weaver, of growing pots, although extremely poorly. Um, you know, of doing, making hundreds and hundreds of things. Um, I am very distrustful of the seduction of that process because I know that it, you can actually kind of stop thinking. Um, and I, um, I knew, like for myself, that I was not an artist that is actually all that meditative when I do the same thing over and over. Like, I am not Agnes Martin with the squares or dots or lines. Like I'm not, you know, zoning into the infinite infinity of the universe in that moment. I'm thinking like, don't slip, don't slip, don't slip. You know, so to know myself and know that, like, 
you know, it makes me sort of think that the labor intensive quality of the work is, again, it's just a kind of a matter of fact. It's not nothing transcendent for me. Um, and so I don't like, the, you know, one aspect of this work is that it's very like virtuosic to have done this. But I am, I am less interested in the virtuosity of having cut out the white space than what this thing is once all the white space is gone. So can you talk a little bit about um, drawing as a, an objective method as a self-work? I didn't, like, I, at school, everybody always wonders what the hell I am doing teaching drawing. And then uh, you know, like all the drawing drawers wonder what I'm doing teaching drawing. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm just doing this because I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. Um, I think that there's something wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work. I don't think that there's anything wrong with drawing as a method of self-work